We all enjoyed uh, Lucas's presentation. He's given you a lot of science, a lot of scientific studies on what's going on in the world of uh, heart disease. And I would like to just pick up on that and continue on what Lucas has given you already. So the idea that fat and cholesterol cause heart disease comes from 1952 from the diet heart hypothesis. This hypothesis has been called the greatest scientific deception of this century, perhaps of any century, by a renowned American doctor and scientist, George Mann, who passed away already, and by many other renowned scientists who really understood science, how it's conducted and how we should uh, analyze it. A hypothesis is not the truth. It's only an idea. It has to be proven. This hypothesis, since it was proposed, no other hypothesis in the world had so much research put into it. Billions have been spent all over the world to prove this hypothesis. Billions. And huge political and commercial machine has been built based on this hypothesis. To prove a hypothesis takes a long time. Science doesn't work fast. And while science was working on this hypothesis, the governments in the Western world have fully committed to it. The media took it a new breakthrough that this is the truth. And all sorts of commercial uh, companies jumped on the bandwagon. Pharmaceutical industry is making billions on this hypothesis. Food industry is making billions. Medical industry is making billions. Western governments are making billions. Hypothesis, this hypothesis today, we can 100% say, has been proven wrong. The diet heart hypothesis is a big mistake. It has been proven wrong for the last 30 years. But because our political and commercial machine has committed to this hypothesis, they work very hard not to allow the population to know the truth, to know the, the, the real scientific truth that came out. As you already heard, 95%, maybe more, of studies in the Western world are funded by commercial companies. In English, we have a very good saying. You know, in Russia, we have another, which is very good. But it says that the one who pays the piper orders the tune. Right? And what is a scientific study? They design it, they collect data, and then the data is analyzed. If any of you studied statistics, how to analyze data, you would know that there are many methods to analyze the data, depending on what result you want to get out of it. Pharmaceutical industry, food industry, and other industries which benefit from this employ an army of statisticians to do just that for them. So all of these studies, 95, almost 100% studies on this subject, we cannot trust. They're full of lies. However, the only science has been working on it. There are only scientists in every country uh, around the world, and they have come up with the truth. So what did the only science actually say? That dietary cholesterol and animal fats have nothing to do with heart disease. They do not cause heart disease. In fact, there is no, no connection. Low blood cholesterol is dangerous. Low blood cholesterol. We'll talk more about it. Not high blood cholesterol. People who eat the most fat and the most cholesterol have the lowest incidence of disease, all disease. The higher your cholesterol level in your blood, the healthier you are altogether. That's what science has demonstrated conclusively, that old people who have high levels of cholesterol have 100% here, no dementia, no Alzheimer's disease. They're healthy, they're sprightly, and they look after themselves, these people. High blood cholesterol does not cause heart disease or atherosclerosis. That is a fact. We've known this fact for the last 20 years. Yet the population is still being told the lies. People with higher cholesterol live the longest 
and the healthiest lives. People who are in their 90s, 80s, and people who reach 100 usually have high blood cholesterol. And they eat eggs and bacon and butter for breakfast <laughs> on a daily basis, these people, almost you know, exclusively. Let's talk about low blood cholesterol. It increases risk of heart disease and stroke. That is a fact. If you have low blood cholesterol, you will have high risk of heart disease and strokes. That is an absolute fact. It is associated with cancer. People who have low blood cholesterol have it low for about 18 years before they're usually diagnosed with cancer. That is the, the number that's been given to us by science. It is associated with violence, aggression, and suicide. We'll talk more about the brain. But what you have to understand, the brain is a fatty organ. It's got a high fat content, the brain. About 40% of that fat is cholesterol. Your brain is made from cholesterol, 40% of it. The substance called myelin coats every nerve fiber and every nerve cell in your nervous system, in your brain, in your spine, in the peripheral nervous system. It's like an insulation around electric wires. You know that electricity, all electric wires have to be insulated? Our brain works on electricity. So that's the insulation. Myelin, more than 60% of it is cholesterol. The rest is saturated fat. That is what myelin is. So when you start reducing blood cholesterol levels, you're putting brain under grave danger. Because brain has cell regeneration processes going on all the time. Cells in the brain do die, and they get replaced by newly born cells. These processes are very active. And these new baby cells need building materials to be made from. They have to be made from cholesterol, saturated fats, proteins, glyconutrients, and some other things. But a large percent is fat and cholesterol. And if the blood cholesterol is low, the brain is not getting enough to maintain its structure and to function properly. People with low blood cholesterol have aggressive personalities and poor self-control. Carl Pfeiffer, a renowned American doctor who did research in American prisons, has discovered that more than 80% of violent offenders, people who committed murder and other violent crimes, had low blood cholesterol. More than 85%. Low blood cholesterol makes the brain starve, the brain cannot function well, the person becomes angry, these people are easily irritated, they easily attack, they easily become aggressive, and they are prone to violence and crime. It is associated with Parkinson's disease. Indeed, now we know that statins cause Parkinson's disease. We have an epidemic of Parkinson's disease. It's growing very rapidly. Without doubt, a large percent of that epidemic is due to anti-cholesterol pills that people are taking. Because the brain is a fatty organ, it requires cholesterol. And if it doesn't get enough, it will manifest symptoms. It is associated with memory loss. In fact, memory loss is the number one side effect of um, starting drugs. The brain cannot function, you can't remember anything. Because in order to form memories in the brain, synapses have to be formed. The cells in the brain have long arms. They grow long arms to communicate with each other. And when the two arms of two cells come together, they have to do this. They have to create a synapse here and a synapse here, and they have to connect. Now, the synapses are almost exclusively made out of cholesterol and saturated fat. If your blood cholesterol is low, that is the only place your brain can get cholesterol from. It can manufacture some, but not enough. Then the brain can't form these synapses. So the cells cannot connect with each other. As a result, the person cannot create memories. And it is the short-term memory that suffers. The person might remember what happened in the childhood, because those synapses were formed in the childhood, but he doesn't remember what he had for breakfast and where he put his car keys, or where he left his hat, you know, or his shoes, 
or something else. The short-term memory is not being formed because the brain doesn't have enough building materials, resources to create memories. These people can't learn anything new because in order to learn something, we have to remember it. We can't form memory. We have an epidemic of Alzheimer's disease. Western governments are, are, are in absolute panic because it is a terrible epidemic and it's like an avalanche coming onto humanity. Alzheimer's disease, dementia. Vast percent of that epidemic is due to statins because every one of these people are taking these drugs. The brain is starving. It cannot form synapses. As a result, the person cannot learn anything, cannot remember anything, and develops Alzheimer's disease. It is associated with poor immunity because our immune cells are high-fat cells. Large percent of the cell membrane and the membranes inside the cell, which form organelles, are made out of cholesterol and saturated fat. And immune cells live a very short life, only a few days, many of them. And when there is any infection in the body, there's a fight going on, many of them die. So the, your bone marrow has to work very hard to give birth to new baby cells, immune cells, because all your immune cells are born in the bone marrow. Bone marrow is a high cholesterol organ. It has a very high composition of cholesterol. And again, most of that cholesterol comes to your bone marrow from the blood. If you have a low level of cholesterol in your blood, your bone marrow is starving. It cannot manufacture immune cells, blood cells, and many other cells. As a result, you, start, you become prone to infections. Western governments are all running around with these hospital infections, MRSA. You've heard of that, haven't you? That hospital infections have become a big problem. Why? Because every patient in these hospitals, older than 40, is on statins. They have reduced their cholesterol level in the blood. They are unable to fight infections. In order to fight an infection, we need LDL cholesterol. That is a major, major part of any fight with any infection in the blood. Your immune system requires large amounts of LDL cholesterol. And what are they doing? They're giving them statins. LDL cholesterol is low. The person cannot fight any infection. They're completely defenseless, these patients. That is why we have hospital infections. That is a major, major cause of it. Learning disabilities in children and adults, without doubt, Mother's breast milk is very rich in cholesterol. It has a high content of cholesterol. More than that, it has an enzyme in it to make sure that the baby's digestive system absorbs 100% of that cholesterol. Not one molecule of it gets wasted when babies are breastfeeding. Why? Because the baby's brain and eyes and bone marrow and other high fat organs require large amounts of cholesterol to form themselves properly. Manufacturers of uh, formula feed for babies know this fact. But because of all the propaganda with cholesterol, they don't put any cholesterol in formulas. That is why it is a very high rate amongst formula-fed babies. They have a very high percentage of poor ability to learn, lower intelligence, problems with behavior, and glasses. They have poor eyesight because their eyes didn't form properly in these children. And infections as well, because bone marrow is not being, being properly formed. It is associated with early death. People with low blood cholesterol don't live long. They die early, usually from cancer or from an infection. People with low blood cholesterol have four times higher rate of AIDS than people with high blood cholesterol. That's a fact. People with low blood cholesterol suffer from infections three times more, and they die from infections much more often than people with normal and high level of cholesterol. We cannot fight infections without cholesterol. What does cholesterol do in the body? Let's have a look. Lucas has uh, covered this question quite well, but I will just add a few things. It is a vital part of every cell membrane. You know that cell membrane is a double layer of fats. 
with the fat soluble ends inside of the membrane and the water soluble on the outside. It's an amazing, amazing structure. But within that uh, structure, there are many receptors because the cell has to communicate with everything else in the world. And these receptors are made out of lipoproteins and a large percent of those lipoproteins are cholesterol and saturated fat in those receptors. In some cells, depending on the function of the cell in the body, depending on where this cell is in the body, some of them have 70% cholesterol in their cell membrane, some have 30. So there's a range between 30 and 70% of cholesterol in the cell membranes in the body. Every cell, about 70% of every cell are membranes. So you can do the calculations yourself. What percent of your body is actually cholesterol and saturated fat? It is more than 50%. You are made from cholesterol. It is a structural element of every cell in your body. And you are made from saturated fats. This is a structural element. And because the cells in the body constantly die and get replaced by newly born cells, building materials are required to build those new baby cells from, to give birth to them. So our bodies require large amounts of cholesterol all the time for that process and saturated fats as well. From cholesterol, all our steroid hormones made in the body. Adrenal hormones. Our adrenals are responsible for handling stress. Every time we're under stress, every time you're working hard or something happened, or you're sitting in the traffic jam and you're late for work, you know, you're stressed. Your blood will be full of cortisol, adrenaline, and other steroid hormones. They're made from cholesterol. So every time you're under stress, adrenals shout to the liver because the blood cholesterol is maintained by our liver. The liver has a factory inside it which manufacture cholesterol. So every time we're under stress, adrenals shout to the liver, I need cholesterol, I need saturated fat. The liver gets the signal and it switches on that factory, works hard, produces all that cholesterol, puts it in the blood to send it to adrenals. In order to travel in a water-based blood, Cholesterol has to be packaged because it is a fat-soluble substance. It can't go naked into your blood. So the liver covers it, puts it in a shuttle called LDL. LDL carries cholesterol from the liver to your adrenals. Once they arrive there in the adrenals, adrenals will unpackage them and convert them into cortisol, glucocorticoids, adrenaline, and other steroid hormones, so you can handle stress. There are people in whom this factory in the liver is broken because they are too toxic or they have nutritional deficiencies. And these are GAPS people. Many, many GAPS people have low blood cholesterol because they are too toxic and this machine is broken in the liver. These people cannot handle stress. They have nervous breakdowns. They start crying and weeping and inconsolable. Children, adults, these people, they fly off the hand or they become aggressive or they attack. And that is a part of any mental illness because the adrenals cannot manufacture hormones and they cannot handle stress, these people. From cholesterol, myelin is made. We talked about it in the nervous system. When we start losing myelin, we develop multiple sclerosis. That is a major disease of loss of myelin. But all other neurological disorders have loss of myelin and all mental disorders. When I examine uh, schizophrenics, when I examine autistic children, they have symptoms, neurological symptoms of multiple sclerosis. So their myelin is being destroyed. In order to rebuild myelin, we need cholesterol, we need fats. And in many of these patients, the factory in the liver is broken, doesn't work, they have low blood cholesterol. What can we do in this situation? We need to eat lots of cholesterol, lots of saturated fat, to give the body a hand, to allow the body to deal with that situation. In my experience, in order to heal people with multiple sclerosis, they must have at least six eggs a day. Lots of butter, lamb fat, beef fat, goose fat, duck fat. The fattiest bits, that is their food. Only then they recover. 
these people because they need to rebuild their myelin. It is essential for memory and learning. From cholesterol, vitamin D is made. When we are sunbathing, your blood cholesterol will be high because the liver is manufacturing it quickly, putting it into packaging into LDL, putting it into the blood, and the blood delivers it to your skin. And there in the skin, the sunlight converts it into vitamin D. Vitamin D is really a hormone because it has an effect on every organ, every function in the body. It's an absolutely amazing substance. We cannot live without it. And because we're human beings evolved on this planet, being naked most of our existence and living outdoors. Only recently we started covering ourselves with clothes and sitting indoors all the time and hiding from the sun. So Mother Nature within the evolution decided that we get enough vitamin D from the sunlight. So she didn't put a lot of vitamin D into food. In order to get a daily amount of vitamin D for an adult in our modern world, we need to eat 20 egg yolks and a kilogram of butter daily. It's a large amount. Or we should eat brain of the animals. The brains of the animals are the richest source of vitamin D and the richest source of cholesterol. Just like our own brains, they have a very high level of cholesterol and a lot of vitamin D in there. So when we are sunbathing, your blood cholesterol is high. When we're under stress, your blood cholesterol is high. When we have any wound, any scratch, any wound, any trauma in the body, your blood cholesterol will be high. Why? Because no healing in the body can happen without involvement of cholesterol. In order to heal any wound, we need to give birth to baby cells to heal the damaged tissue because the damaged tissue, all those damaged cells will be discarded. You can't heal them, you just throw them away. New cells have to be born. In order for them to be born, membranes need to be formed. And those membranes are largely cholesterol and saturated fat. So every time you had surgery, every time you went to a dentist, every time you hurt yourself, your blood cholesterol will be high because your liver is working hard to manufacture this healing substance. It puts it in the blood and the blood delivers it to the place that is hurt, to the place that needs healing. After cholesterol has done its, its, its jobs in that place, it's taken back to the liver to be recycled. And the shuttle that does that is called HDL, high density lipoprotein. Our clever science, in its wisdom, called the LDL the bad cholesterol, the HDL the good cholesterol. It's the same as to say that the ambulance which goes from the base to the patient is the good ambulance, and the one that takes the, uh, goes from the patient back to the base is the, the bad ambulance. It's that, that, that kind of analogy, or vice versa. That cholesterol just travels back to the liver to be recycled, and the other cholesterol goes to the place to be used. So they cannot be good or bad. And indeed, our science recently has discovered that indeed that is the fact, but they found little percent of LDL cholesterol, which they still say is bad. So now we doctors are told to call that part the good bad cholesterol. The rest of it we have to call the bad bad cholesterol. That's how silly and confusing all of this is. It is essential for immunity, cholesterol, we talked about it, and bile salts are made from cholesterol. Without bile, we cannot digest fats, we cannot absorb fats, and we cannot absorb fat-soluble vitamins. Vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin K, and vitamin E. Without these four vitamins, there is no life. We cannot live without these vitamins. Many people, particularly GAPS people, have lots of bile stones blocking their biliary ducts, so the bile doesn't flow. These are the people who can't digest fats, their skin becomes dry, their hair becomes dry, and they develop learning problems, memory problems, because they can't digest fats in their food. As a result, fats are not absorbed, and usually these people are constipated because the fat, which is not digested, combines with salts in the bowel and forms a, a form of soap, very sticky, sticky soap. 
and the person becomes constipated. That is a major, major cause of constipation in people. So bile is absolutely essential for us to digest fats and to absorb fats. And bile is extremely rich in cholesterol. When the bile reaches ileum, the last part of the intestine, most of the bile salts are reabsorbed back into the bloodstream and returned to the liver. Most of that cholesterol is reabsorbed. Just that fact should have given us a clue just how important cholesterol is for the human body, that it carefully reabsorbs it and carefully recycles it, reuses it. People with high cholesterol live longer. All the people need more cholesterol. So what I would like to say here that whatever your cholesterol is in your blood, that is your right cholesterol. Do not interfere with it. In fact, I recommend to people never test your blood cholesterol. If your doctor suggests you, let's test your blood cholesterol, say, no, thank you. Whatever it is, that's good for me. Because if you do allow the doctor to test your blood cholesterol, then there will be pressure to put you on statins, pressure to do more testing, and there will be fear-mongering, scare-mongering. Our doctors are trained to do that very well. They've done such a good job that majority of the population believes that if they don't take statins, they will die from heart attack, definitely. They actually believe that. I know many people who believe that, which is an absolute lie. It is not true at all. Which foods are rich in cholesterol? So when your factory in the liver is struggling and cannot produce enough cholesterol, it's a good idea to give it some help by eating high cholesterol foods. Animal brain. Animal brain in all traditional cultures for thousands of years was considered to be a delicacy. This was a precious, precious food that was given to the most important people in the family, to couples who are trying to conceive a baby, to a person who is recovering from severe illness, and to a warrior who came wounded from the war. They gave the brains to eat because they knew that this is a healing food. Brains were a sacred food in majority of traditional cultures around the world. Caviar is very rich in cholesterol, egg, um, fish eggs. Of course, it's not a common food for the majority of people. <laughs> so let's move on. <laughs> Cod liver oil, that is a traditional immune boosting remedy. I'm sure many of you remember your grandmothers and your, your parents giving you a spoonful of this stuff every morning when you were small. Cod liver oil provides fish oils. It provides a lot of vitamin D and vitamin A in the right proportions. But the richest part of it is cholesterol. It is very rich in cholesterol. And without doubt, that is the uh, major immune boosting part of cod liver oil. Fresh egg yolks give us a nice amount, as long as they're raw and cooked. Butter gives us a nice amount. Cold water fish and shellfish have a, a high level of cholesterol, very good level. And lard, pork fat, beef fat, give us nice amounts of cholesterol. If you look at that, you can see that fish is almost two times richer in cholesterol than meat. Majority of doctors are not aware of this fact because they're telling you, stop eating meat, it's full of cholesterol. Eat fish instead. They obviously don't realize that fish is much richer in cholesterol than meat. But we need to eat all of these foods. These are the facts that also people need to understand. Only about 15% of your blood cholesterol comes from food. Food has very little effect on your blood cholesterol. Vast majority of it is manufactured by the liver in response to what's going on in your body. If your brain asks for cholesterol, the liver will put it in into the bloodstream and your blood cholesterol will be high. One cannot reduce blood cholesterol by diet alone, by reducing fat and cholesterol in the diet. That doesn't work, has been proven in hundreds of scientific studies. Stopping to eat eggs and butter will make no difference to your blood cholesterol whatsoever. Because the more cholesterol you eat, the less your body has to work hard to produce it. 
the less cholesterol you eat, the more your body will produce to compensate. It will just have to work harder. Drugs, however, are a completely different matter. Statins break that factory in your liver that produces cholesterol. They break it down, they smash it. As a result, your blood cholesterol goes low, your brain is starving, your adrenals can't produce hormones, you can't produce sex hormones. In order to have children, we need sex hormones. In order to procreate. Every sex hormone is made from cholesterol. People who go on low-fat diets and reduce their blood cholesterol levels become infertile. They cannot produce children. We have an infertility epidemic in the Western world. Many couples can't produce children in the Western world. What these ladies and men need to do is eat cream every day. Butter, eggs, fat, and they will have a child very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> very quickly. And eat some brain, and eat some caviar and cod liver oil, and you will have a child in a month. <laughs> you will conceive. These are the common side effects of statins. They're well known, but doctors wouldn't tell you about this. Heart failure through coenzyme Q10 deficiency. This is a, a, a chemical that every muscle in the body requires in large amounts. It cannot function. Muscles cannot function without this chemical, particularly the heart. The heart never stops. It works all the time, all throughout our lives. It requires large amounts of this substance. Statins stop its production in the body. People develop deficiency. And many people die from heart, from heart failure as a result. The energy level goes down. What is heart failure? When your heart is not coping, the first thing that will happen to you, you are tired all the time. You have no energy. These are the first symptoms of heart failure. And that's what usually happens to people who start taking statins. They feel tired all the time, have no energy. Statins break down muscle tissue. Muscles get dissolved by statins. And that muscle dissolving turns into debris of protein, bits and pieces of protein, which go into your bloodstream and block up your kidneys. Because your kidneys have to excrete it. That can cause a kidney failure. And when that happens, the muscles are being broken down by statins. People have pain in their muscles. That's called rhabdomyolysis. The muscles are painful. They hurt. And many people who start taking statins say that my body hurts. I have an aching and pain in my muscles everywhere. It's a very dangerous side effect because you can lose your kidneys through this process. You can develop kidney failure and finish up on dialysis for the rest of your life, thanks to these drugs. So kidney damage, kidney failure due to rhabdomyolysis, very common side effect. Liver damage, because they break down that factory inside your liver that manufactures cholesterol. Cholesterol is involved in thousands of functions in the body, in every organ, every cell of the body. Many of these functions cannot be accomplished in the body. So liver damage is fo follows. No nerve damage, polyneuropathy, because myelin is being dissolved. Every nerve fiber has to be coated by myelin. And myelin again renews itself all the time because these are beautiful cells which slap themselves on the nerves. These cells don't live very long, they die. New cells have to be born. In order to give birth to a new myelin cell, we need cholesterol, we need saturated fat, we need proteins and other things. And as a result, there is a nerve damage, multiple sclerosis, undoubtedly statin uh, uh, prescriptions contribute to multiple sclerosis epidemic and to other neurological disorders, neuropathies. Parkinson's disease, that's been proven. Statins cause Parkinson's disease. I met so many people who are shaking, and I asked them, are you taking statins? Yes. I'm not going to stop because I don't want to die from heart disease. But you are developing Parkinson's disease, dear. And Parkinson's disease comes with dementia. Who wants to finish up as a vegetable? Yes, your heart might be okay, but you'll be a vegetable. Cognitive decline and memory loss, we talked about it. The brain is a high cholesterol organ. 
It starves. Depression, short temper, violent behavior. Many wives of men who started taking statins tell me that his personality changed. He became cantankerous and difficult to live with. And that happens to women as well. Fetal malformations if used in pregnancy. Indeed, the fetal malformations that we saw from statin use during pregnancy were worse than were found from thalidomide. I don't know, many of you heard about thalidomide? These are children who finished up with an arm this long and a few fingers at the end. But the malformations that were caused by statins were even worse. That is why pregnant women are not given statins. Cancer. Statins are a major cause of cancer. Because in order to deal with any situation in the body, we need a functional immune system. Immune system is made out of cholesterol to a large degree. If you reduce your blood cholesterol, you have no immune system. It doesn't work. So you cannot protect yourself from cancer, infections, or anything else. Let's talk about saturated fatty acids, which have been pronounced evil by our mainstream. Do you know that the heart is sitting in a big case of fat? How many of you have seen a heart of a lamb or a beef or another animal when they killed? The heart is about that big. It's, it's about the size of your fist. You know, the size of your heart is exactly the size of your fist. But around it is about fat that thick. And that fat is highly saturated. Because this is your heart's energy store. That's where the energy for the heart comes from, from this saturated fat. Your heart functions exclusively on saturated fat. Energy for the heart comes from the fat, not from carbohydrates, not from glucose, not from the sugar. It lowers a substance called LPA in the blood, which has been proven to cause atherosclerosis. The more saturated fat we eat, the lower your level of this substance, LPA. It reduces calcium deposition in your arteries. Because in order for us to have vitamin K2, which makes sure that calcium goes into your teeth and bones, we have to absorb it. The only way to absorb it, we need fat. That's how it absorbs, and it comes from fats, this vitamin. It is essential for all tissue repair in the body because a large percent of all membranes in your cell are made of cholesterol. The other part of it is saturated fatty acids. We are made from saturated fats. Your body is made from saturated fats and cholesterol to a large degree. They are structural and they're essential for the function. It is vital part of every cell membrane. It is essential for us to be able to use omega-3 fatty acids. Without saturated fat, we cannot use these fatty acids. They get wasted in the body. It is essential for the immune system structure and function, essential for the brain structure and function. And animal fats are not all saturated. Let's have a look at the structure of animal fats. This is the proportions of pork fat. German people eat a lot of pork. Well done. <laughs> pork is good for us. 45% of it is monounsaturated, oleic acid, the same as in olive oil. 11% polyunsaturated, and only 44% saturated. So strictly speaking, pork fat is monounsaturated. It is not a saturated fat. And depending on how the pigs were reared, how they grew up, if the pigs grew up on grass, because pigs eat a lot of grass, they need to grow up in forests, and they eat acorns and chestnuts and other things in the forest. The more they grow on grass, the more they grow, the more they have omega-3 in them, and omega-6 in them, and many other, uh, and conjugated linoleic acid, which is very important for protecting from heart disease. Lamb fat, 38% of it is monounsaturated, 2% polyunsaturated, and 58% saturated. The composition of our own fat in our human bodies is the closest to the lamb fat the composition of the human fat. Beef fat, 
Again, 47% monounsaturated, 4% polyunsaturated, 49% saturated. Butter, 52% saturated, 30% monounsaturated, 4% polyunsaturated. Again, this depends on what kind of milk it comes from. This is commercial butter. But if you take real butter from real cows on pasture, that will have much higher percent of omega-3s in it and conjugated linoleic acid. Let's have a look at the human breast milk. If there, if there ever was the right composition of fats for the human being in the food, that's it. Human breast milk is the perfect food for the human being. 48% of it is saturated. 33 monounsaturated and 16% polyunsaturated. That is the right composition of fats for us human beings. Let's come to all these vegetable oils and margarine that the mainstream has been telling us for decades are good for us. They are vigorously promoted as heart healthy. They are full of very har harmful fats. Part of those harmful fats have been studied quite well. They're called trans fats. And the research that came out shows that they cause every disease, every degenerative disease under the sun. And we had this knowledge from 1930s. We had scientific studies from 1930s to demonstrate that vegetable oils cause heart disease, cancer, infertility, psychiatric illness, learning disabilities in children, and every diabetes and every other disease. They cause it. Why? Because they are made out of very fragile polyunsaturated fatty acids. They are easily damaged by light, oxygen, and heat. That is why Mother Nature wisely locked these fats within the structure of plants. The lettuce leaves, the apples, nuts, oily seeds, and other plants. When we eat these plants in their fresh form, we get all of these polyunsaturated fatty acids in the right amount and in the right biochemical shape and form, and they're good for us. But what do we do? We take all that plant matter to our big factories, we chop it up, and we subject them to high heat, to oxygen, to chemical solvents, to pressure, to all sorts of things. So all of these fragile polyunsaturated fatty acids get mutilated. They are chemically mutilated molecules which have no place in the human body. This is pollution, poisonous pollution coming into your body. Never ever buy these oils, never cook on them. And there is a big risk in eating out because all our food in restaurants, takeaway meals and everywhere else are cooked with these poisonous oils cooking oils and vegetable oils. They cause cancer, diabetes, neurological damage, and immune problems, cause atherosclerosis and heart disease. This has been proven. They cause atherosclerosis and heart disease. They're not just associated. They actively cause it. They cause infertility. It is a major factor in our infertility epidemic. They interfere with pregnancy. They're dangerous for a fetus and a baby. They accelerate aging. And margarine is made out of these oils. Your spreadable butter is made out of these oils. All your spreadable and other butter replacements are made out of these oils. Nobody should be eating them. Atherosclerosis. Let's come to atherosclerosis. Before I do that, I can feel a question in some people's heads. What about... Uh, Plant oils that are available as supplements. Flaxseed oil, hemp oil, walnut oil, avocado oil, linseed oil. You need to be in contact with the company. These oils need to be extracted in vacuum conditions, in cold conditions, and in the dark. And then they need to be stored in a dark glass in the fridge. Because they get damaged, these are very fragile fatty acids that get damaged by light, heat, and oxygen. And you must never cook them. You must never heat them. A lot of oils, I'm afraid, on the market which are sold as supplements are rancid, oxidized already. 
If there is any rancid smell, don't use it, no matter how much you paid for it. Just eat fruit and vegetables, nuts, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, particularly sprouted. You'll get plenty of the soils for your body. Because human body needs only very little omega-3 and omega-6. Only a tiny amount. We don't need a lot of them. Less than 3%. 97% of your fat consumption must be animal fats because they provide the right composition of fatty acids for your own body, for your physiology. Right, what is atherosclerosis? atherosclerosis. We now know, a plethora of scientific studies have shown that it is an inflammatory condition. It's inflammation through and through. Let's have a look at it. What happens with atherosclerosis? All our blood vessels and inside our heart are lined by a layer of cells called endothelium. Inside your heart, inside your arteries, inside your capillaries, your veins, it's all endothelium. It's an amazing organ, endothelium. It produces hormones and it decides what should come from the blood into the tissues and what shouldn't. Anything toxic that gets into your body, whether it's a virus, a bacterium, a chemical, mercury, lead, anything else, sooner or later finishes up in your bloodstream because that's your motorway system in the body, your blood. It carries things around. When these things finish up in your blood, what are they going to do? They're going to attack. They attack your endothelium. They cause a wound in the endothelium, a damage in it. When there is any wound in the body, the first thing that happens, that place starts producing substances called cytokines and eicosanoids, which run through the liver and say, din, 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 need cholesterol, need saturated fat. There's an injury, I need to heal it. So the liver switches on that factory, manufactures cholesterol, manufactures saturated fatty acids, packages them into LDLs and other shuttles and sends them to that place to heal them, to heal the wound. How does healing happen in the human body with any wound, whether you scratched your skin, whether you bit your tongue or anything else happened to you or you had surgery, so your tissues were cut? There are two partners in healing in the body. One is inflammation, the second one is repair. So when there is any injury, the body switches on inflammation first. What is inflammation? The immune system comes there, immune cells, they're like an army, like soldiers in an army. They kill the enemy and they clean away the debris, they clean the site. That's what inflammation does. It will destroy the virus, destroy the bacterium, or neutralize those chemicals that cause the wound inside your artery, and then clean the place up, remove all the debris because the immune cells, macrophages, microphages, they swallow the debris. They gobble them up inside themselves and then they move away. They remove all this debris, they leave the place clean. Once the place is clean, the second partner comes in called repair. What does repair do? Repair, first and foremost, grows collagen. Remember, your body is made out of collagen to a large degree. This is the molecules that hold us together. It will grow collagen, a network of collagen, like a network of wires across that wound to seal it, like a bandage across that wound to seal it. And at the same time, this process starts giving birth to new cells of endothelium to repair that place. And these cells then hold themselves onto the collagen fibers, onto that network of fibers in there. And with, before you know it, a few hours, that wound is healed, as if nothing has happened in your artery. This is a natural process, and this process begins in the fetus, before the baby even born. Because even in the fetus, as soon as their vascular system is formed, their little heart is formed, and the arteries are formed inside the baby, inside the womb, Poisons and toxins from the mother start getting into that blood and start causing injury to the endothelium. So this process begins even then. 
and it goes on in all of us, all of our life. Inflammation, repair, an hour maximum, couple of hours, the place is healed as if nothing happened in your artery at all. It's a beautiful process, and this process worked for us for hundreds of millions of years, perfectly well, until we invented something to stop that process. So what is an atherosclerosis? It's an inflammation out of control. What we human beings have invented? We invented processed carbohydrates. We invented things made out of sugar, flour, soya flour, and vegetable oils. All your breakfast cereals are poisons. Nobody should be eating them. Sugar is a poison, the most addictive substance in the world. Modern bread, pastries, pasta, all of these sort of things, what are they? They are processed carbohydrates. When these things come into your stomach, into your digestive system, they are pre-digested in the factories by the food industry. They require virtually no digestion. They get broken down very quickly and they absorb in the form of molecules of glucose. Glucose is in our blood, but the human body controls it within certain limits because too high, too low can kill. It's dangerous. Glucose can be very, very damaging. When you ate your pasta or you ate your white bread with your jam in the morning and a bit of margarine on the top, there's a huge amount of glucose absorbs into your bloodstream, uncontrolled. It's an absolute attack. So what does the body do in this situation? It sends a shock signal to the pancreas to produce insulin in uncontrolled amounts. Because the function of insulin, that's a hormone, to remove glucose out of the blood, into the cells, into your muscles, into your fat tissue, into other cells in the body. Because every cell on the body has little doors on it, glucose itself cannot open those doors. Insulin is the key that opens these little doors and pushes the glucose into the cells. In normal amounts, the cells can use glucose for production of energy. Vast majority of the human body, the cells use fat for production of energy, actually. Contrary to the mainstream propaganda, which comes from leukosaid manufacturers, it's not glucose that pro produces energy for you, it's fat. The source of energy in the body is fat. But many cells can use glucose as a form of energy. However, every cell in the human body has only a limited ability how much glucose they can take in. If the person had sugar and this sort of thing only occasionally, insulin will be produced, it will remove all that excessive glucose out of your bloodstream into the cells, the cells will process it, and the body can cope. But what do people do? What do our children do from a very young age? They have a sugary breakfast cereal in the morning, then they eat sandwich for lunch, crisps in the middle, and they eat pasta in the evening, and lots of sweets, chocolates, and soft drinks in between. A bottle of Coca-Cola has eight teaspoons of sugar in it, and it absorbs in seconds. It's pre-digested. Your digestive system has nothing to do with it. It just floods into your bloodstream. So if that situation continues day after day, week after week, year after year, the cells in the body say, well, I had enough. I can't take this glucose anymore, it's too much. The way they say it is by destroying those little doors on their wall that insulin opens. They become insulin resistant. They stop responding to insulin, the cells. That is the beginning of diabetes. What can the body do in that situation? Because the person continues eating bread, continues eating breakfast cereals, continues eating pasta, and all these other processed carbohydrates, the body starts producing more insulin and more insulin. Insulin is a master fat storage hormone in the body. The person finishes up with a high level of insulin all the time. They store everything they eat as fat as a result. A piece of lettuce will go into your thighs. 
straight away because that's the only thing that can be done. High level of insulin is a cause of obesity epidemic in our world. And high level of insulin is caused by processed carbohydrates, soft drinks, breakfast cereals, biscuits, cakes, sugar, bread, pasta. Apart of that, from that, there's another function that insulin does when there is too much insulin in the bloodstream. Inflammation is initiated in the body, but insulin will never allow it to stop because insulin is a pro-inflammatory hormone. It causes inflammation in the body and it will not allow it to stop. So the person finishes up in a pro-inflammatory state. Their body is constantly inflamed. <coughs> every organ, everywhere. And that is the basis now we know with our recent scientific studies, that is the basis for formation of cancer. Cancer is an inflammation. Formation of mental illness, these people are in pro-inflammatory state, diabetes, obesity, and all the other degenerative diseases, pro-inflammatory state. Majority of the Western population are constantly in a pro-inflammatory state because of what they're eating. Because they are piling in glucose into their bodies in uncontrolled amounts and think that this is good because that is what the mainstream propaganda has told them for years. So inflammation is out of control. So let's come back to that little wound inside your artery. Something caused the wound in there. Inflammation is launched. It killed the enemy. It cleaned the site. So the repair comes in now to repair the place. But inflammation can't stop because insulin is too high in the body and because the person is eating breakfast cereals and continues eating sweets and continues drinking soft drinks. Inflammation doesn't stop. Inflammation is the destroyer. So the repair is trying to build those collagen fibers to put the, ne the mesh over the wound, put the bandage over the wound, and tries to build new cells, new baby cells in there, into that mesh, while inflammation is destroying all that and tearing it apart and destroying it and tearing it apart. So as a result, instead of being partners, brothers that they used to be, inflammation and repair, they become enemies. They start fighting each other right there inside your artery wall. So as soon as the repair, repair needs cholesterol, as soon as the repair tries to build collagen, new cells, repair this place, all these substances get torn and torn apart and destroyed by the inflammation. So the place of that damage, instead of healing, turns into a pile of rubbish, in, into a never healing ulcer inside your artery wall. That is what atherosclerosis is. It is not a lump of fat and cholesterol stuck to your wall. It is a never healing ulcer inside your artery because of what you're eating. There are three stages to the development of this ulcer. In the first stage, the damage is done, inflammation gets in there, kills the enemy, cleans the place and repair starts repairing. In the second stage, the two are fighting each other. Inflammation would not go away. Repair is trying to repair it, and they continue fighting each other. This second stage can last years, 20 years in your body. You don't know what's going on in your artery. It might be going on in several places in your artery. You have no idea that is going on. Depending on your diet, depending on what you're doing, that also can get smaller or can get bigger. If you read a good book or went to a conference like this and stopped eating sugar and breakfast cereals and vegetable oils and other processed carbohydrates, then repair will win. Inflammation will go away, repair will win, and it will heal that also. And you don't need to know about it. It will disappear and it will never do you any damage. You don't need to know about it. But if you don't know and you continue eating what the doctors are telling you eating and you continue eating what the mainstream is telling you to eat, then the inflammation will win. And if the inflammation wins, it takes this ulcer to the third, final stage, 
which is the third stage plaque, and that is the cause of all heart attacks and other disasters. It causes 76% of all fatal heart attacks. Let's look at this ulcer. What's in it? A third stage atherosclerotic plaque. 68% of it is fibrous repair tissue, collagen. That bandage that repair is putting on top of that wound. One bandage, another bandage, another bandage. Inflammation keeps tearing them apart, tearing them apart. And repair keeps fighting and fighting and building new bandages. So 68% of that is those bandages in the atherosclerotic plaque. Collagen. 8% is calcium because calcium is always in the blood, it floats about, and it has an ability to get attached to all the debris, to all the damaged tissues, to calcify them. 7% inflammatory cells, inflammation is very active in that place. 1% foam cells, these are macrophages, immune cells which swallowed lots of debris, and they change their appearance and the science called them foam cells, but they are immune cells. And only 16% of that is lipid-rich necrotic core. That is the big rubbish dump inside your artery wall, where all the debris, the dead cells, destroyed cholesterol, destroyed fats, destroyed other tissues accumulate because inflammation keeps destroying tissues in there. And 74% of all fats in the core are unsaturated. Where do they come from? Not from your butter. They came from vegetable oils, from your margarine and your butter replacements, and all the processed foods you ate, which are full of these things, your crisps, your chips, and other things fried in vegetable oil. Fats and cholesterol in the plaque are not the real cholesterol and real fat that is in the egg yolk and in butter. They are chemically mutilated, damaged molecules. They are damaged by the immune system, by the inflammation. In order to repair the tissue, the blood will keep bringing these molecules into that area, but the inflammation attacks them immediately with free radicals, because immune cells use free radicals as guns and bullets to fight the enemy. They damage this cholesterol, they damage these fats, and they become useless. The body cannot use them. So they're just dumped in the middle of that rubbish pile inside your arterial wall. This is the picture of the atherosclerotic plaque. That is where the blood flows. That is the middle of the artery. You see how narrow it becomes? And that is the plaque. You see, on top of this plaque, we have the bandage. That is collagen that repair system has built to separate this rubbish tip, this rubbish pile, from the bloodstream. And that's the rubbish pile. You see, full of damaged cells, broken down collagen, broken down immune cells, foam cells, and broken down cholesterol and fat. That's what it is. Obviously, in this person, inflammation is winning. Because inflammation, if it would go away and repair would win, it will dissolve all this, remove it all. And, the, and this, the, the, the middle of the artery become, will become wide again and the blood will flow again in there. So what are the fats and cholesterol really doing in there? They are healing agents in the body, essential for both inflammation and repair. Remember, your immune system is largely made out of cholesterol and saturated fat, and it requires a lot of these substances to fight, to work. And repair needs them to build new tissues, to give birth to new cells. So both of them need these substances. That is why every time you have a surgery, your blood cholesterol will be high because the liver is working hard to send these healing substances to your wound, to repair it. And what is your doctor going to do? Put you on statins, right? <laughs> Every time you went to a dentist, your blood cholesterol will be high because things are damaged in your mouth after visiting a dentist, they need healing. 
They need repairing. Cholesterol will be delivered to your gums, to your mouth, to repair those tissues. Every time you have stress, severe stress, you'll have high blood cholesterol. Because stress hormones need to be manufactured and because a lot of damage was caused by stress in the body. Stress is very destructive in the body. So many situations in life will require high blood cholesterol. That is why I'm telling you, never ever test it. Please, tell your doctor, no thank you, I'm all right. I don't want to know. Because you don't want to know. Because if your doctor finds that your blood cholesterol is slightly higher than they think it should be, you'll be under pressure to go on the statins and they will give you a lot of fear. They're good at creating fear in their patients. I'm a medical doctor, I know how it works. LDL, or so-called bad cholesterol, takes cholesterol from the liver to the damaged artery. HDL, or so-called good cholesterol, returns cholesterol from the artery back to the liver to be recycled. But it gets damaged by free radicals in the wound, as I said, because the immune system uses inflammation is a place where there's lots of free radicals because this is, what, this is the weapons of the immune system, free radicals. HDL cholesterol carries uh, antioxidants, vitamin C, vitamin E, lipoic acid, and other, which can repair cholesterol. Those damaged, oxidized molecules of cholesterol in the plaque can be repaired by antioxidants. Chemically damaged, oxidized cholesterol and fats get deposited in the plaque. So these are the things that are useless for the body. They cannot be repaired. Let's introduce you to the real cause of heart disease and epidemic in the Western world, in the so-called civilized world. It isn't cholesterol, it isn't fats. It is metabolic syndrome. What is metabolic syndrome? High level of insulin in your blood. That is metabolic syndrome. Any person who is walking about constantly with high levels of insulin in their blood have chronic inflammation in their body everywhere. Because wherever inflammation is initiated, it cannot stop, because insulin will not allow it to stop. So the real cause of heart disease epidemic is sugar, bread, breakfast cereals, pasta, vegetable oils, biscuits, cakes, and other processed and soft drinks. Other processed carbohydrates that Western population is gorging on. That's what they eat, day in and day out, and they think it's all right. <laughs> that is the cause of cancer, of the immune disease, of mental illness, of heart disease, atherosclerosis, diabetes, and every other disease in the Western world, in the modern world. Because they cause a glucose overload in the body. Human body has not been designed to get such huge amounts of one particular molecule. If you eat carbohydrates in a natural state, the way Mother Nature gave them to us, raw fruit, raw vegetables, raw grains, they're very difficult to digest. In fact, they're indigestible for the human digestive system. And most carbohydrate that's in them is indigestible. It goes through us, it doesn't absorb, doesn't digest, finishes up in your bowel, where the microbes in your bowel work on it. They digest it, and they manufacture, they convert all those carbohydrates, more than 75, 80% of them, into short chain fatty acids, which are fully saturated fat. So when we eat natural plants in a natural state, we digest them as saturated fat. They absorb, they feed our immune system, they feed our brain, they support us between meals. But generally speaking, high up, plants are indigestible. But what our industry does, it makes them very, very, very digestible by processing them. Flour is a highly processed carbohydrate, wheat flour. And then from this processed carbohydrate, we make bread, pasta, biscuits, cakes, and the rest of it making them even more processed. They cause glucose overload in the body and overproduction of insulin. You finish up 
with high level of insulin in your blood all the time. That is what our doctors should be testing. Not cholesterol. When they take your sample of blood, they should test insulin in your bloodstream and C-reactive protein for the marker of inflammation to see if you have got systemic inflammation in the body. These are the two things they should be testing, all of you, not cholesterol. Overproduction of insulin leads to insulin resistance in the body. That is diabetes. That's basically another name for diabetes. Too much insulin leads to permanent inflammation, and perpetual inflammation is the cause of atherosclerosis and heart disease and cancer and everything else. So what are the real causes of heart disease epidemic? Number one, metabolic syndrome, high insulin in your bloodstream. Number two, anything that can cause injury to your endothelium. That's a number two. That is a less important cause. And here we have man-made chemicals, personal care products, laundry dishwasher detergents, domestic cleaning chemicals, your redecoration building materials, pharmaceuticals, smoking, industrial pollution, agricultural chemicals, tap water full of chlorine, fluoride, and other chemicals, processed foods, microbes. Many microbes have been found inside atherosclerotic plaque. These are microbes usually which come from chronic inflammation, chronic uh, infection places in your body, such as your root canal in your teeth. There is no such thing as a clean root canal. They do not exist. Every root canal is infected. And chlamydia, pneumonia, H. pylori, cytomegalovirus, and all these other microbes have been found in the atherosclerotic plaque. They probably caused the wound, started the process in there, and because the person is living on processed carbohydrates, they have high levels of insulin in the body, pro-inflammatory state, they develop atherosclerosis. Abnormal gut flora. A person with abnormal gut flora has a river of toxicity flowing from the gut into the bloodstream. These toxins will cause injury to your arteries, to your endothelium, and start the process in there. Nutritional deficiencies. The homocysteine, for example, uh, this is a, a very damaging molecule that appears in your blood when we are deficient in B vitamins. B12, B6, folate in particular, and zinc. And recently we've added magnesium to that, and we've added something else to that, coenzyme Q10. LPA is another substance when we're deficient in vitamin C. It appears in the bloodstream. You know that sauerkraut provides you with 20 times more bioavailable vitamin C than the same helping of fresh cabbage. You Germans should know this, and Switzerland people as well. Because in a fresh cabbage, vitamin C is locked in the cellular structure, and your digestive system is unable to digest it. It can't extract it. But when we ferment cabbage to make sauerkraut, the bacteria in the fermentation release vitamin C from the cellular structure into the whole mixture. So when you're eating sauerkraut, you're getting plenty of vitamin C, large amounts of it. You know that uh, famous British explorer, James Cook, who discovered Australia, New Zealand, and half the world, he had barrels of sauerkraut on his ships. That is why his, uh, so the, his sailors never had scurvy. They never had vitamin C deficiency because they ate fermented cabbage. That was a, a little detour. Okay, lack of sun exposure leading to vitamin D deficiency is a cause and other. Radiation, electromagnetic pollution, stress, sedentary lifestyle. But what you need to understand, that we humans were always exposed to many of these factors throughout our existence on our planet, through millions of years. Because we had volcanoes exploding, climate was changing, lots of things were changing on the planet. We always had pollution, we always had stress, we always had to deal with these situations. They are not the cause of heart disease. Smoking doesn't cause heart disease on its own. I know many people in their 90s who smoked like chimneys all their life. They're fine. You know why? Because they don't eat sugar. And they don't eat bread. 
that eat eggs and butter and bacon for breakfast. That is why they're healthy. The cause of heart disease is metabolic syndrome. If you don't have that in your body, you, your body can process many chemicals, many toxins, many things, and you will not get atherosclerosis. In order to get it, you need metabolic syndrome. So what do we need to do to protect ourselves from heart disease? Avoid processed carbohydrates. Sugar, this is the biggest poison in the world, and it is a number one addictive substance in the world. It is more addictive than morphine, heroin, cannabis, or anything else. It is the most addictive substance. Breakfast cereals, poisonous. Don't put them in your mouth. Horrid stuff. Breads, pastries, pasta, biscuits, cookies. Soft drinks, poisonous. Crisps, popcorn, commercial snacks, ready meals, condiments, sweets, chocolates, and so on. What do we need to eat to pr protect ourselves from heart disease? All meals should be cooked at home from natural ingredients. If it doesn't look like what Mother Nature made, don't buy it. Buy fresh vegetables and fruit, buy fresh meat, fresh butter, fresh eggs, the best quality from a farmer, preferably. All fish cooked from fresh or frozen. Organ meats. Organ meats are an absolute panacea for every disease. Liver, kidneys, tongue, heart, brains. If you eat these foods on a regular basis, you will prevent any nutritional deficiency in your body. And if your body is well fed, properly nourished, it will deal with everything else. You don't need to know. It will deal with pollution. It will deal with everything else. But if you don't feed your body properly, then it cannot cope. Organ meats must be a regular part of every human being's diet. Good quality eggs. We want eggs from chickens which are in the sunshine. Only then will they have vitamin D in their egg yolks. If chickens are locked in a barn, in cages, they have no vitamin D in their egg yolks. And the yellow color comes from a chemical that they add to their feed, a colorant. If they didn't add that yellow colorant into the feed of the chickens, their egg yolks will be pale. They will not be yellow. Yellow color comes from grass that chickens eat. So chickens must be on pasture, not on a concrete floor. On grass, in the sunshine, free ranging. Then they will find most of their food. An egg is almost pure protein and fat. Chickens on pasture find their own food, grubs, worms, insects. Chickens eat a lot of meat in the form of insects and worms and grubs and other things. This is the kind of eggs we're talking about. These are the kinds of eggs we want to find. <clears throat> fresh vegetables and fresh fruit, we want them organic because animals have a powerful detoxification systems. Whatever chemicals they're exposed to, their detox system will handle many of these chemicals, neutralize them. So it is actually safer to eat non-organic meat than to eat a carrot that has been sprayed directly because vegetables and fruit don't have a detox system in them. So organic fruit and vegetables are really important. Meat doesn't have to be organic because it's expensive. Many people find it too expensive to buy. Nuts and seeds, again, they shouldn't be roasted, coated in any chemicals. Buy them in their shells, crack them at home, make them an important part of your diet. Natural. Fermented dairy and raw milk, we talked about it today. Honey and dried fruit. Mother Nature gave us two wonderful sweetness. Why do we need sugar? Why do we need aspartame, which causes multiple sclerosis? Why do we need xylitol, which is an alcohol, and many other commercial sweetness? Honey will sweeten anything for you beautifully. When you have your cup of coffee, put some honey in it. When you're baking a cake, put some honey in it, or dates, dried fruit. They will sweeten your baking beautifully for you. Honey is a food that is made by nature. It is balanced. Every molecule of sugar in it, the sweetness in it, is balanced with magnesium, with chromium, with proteins, with, with other things. 
so your body can process it healthily and it will only benefit you. Sugar is not a natural molecule, it isn't a natural substance. Because in order for the human body to metabolize one molecule of sugar, we need 56 molecules of magnesium. We need dozens of chromium, we need zinc, we need enzymes, we need proteins, we need fats. When we take, where does the sugar come from? From sugar cane and sugar beet. When we take a piece of fresh sugar cane or a piece of fresh sugar beet, analyze them in the laboratory, we find that indeed every molecule of sugar in these natural foods are equipped with 56 molecules of magnesium and all those molecules of chromium and zinc and enzymes and all the other things. So when we chew sugar cane as it is, we get it in a complex and it does us only good, it's healthy. But we don't do that, do we? We take sugar cane and sugar beet to a big factory, we take the sugar out of them and we throw everything else away. And this sugar comes into your body like a villain, like a highway robber. It needs those 56 molecules of magnesium. Where are they going to come from? From your muscles, from your brain, from your heart, from your bones. And every one of those tissues will suffer and develop disease. In order for your arteries to contract, they need calcium. In order to relax, they need magnesium. If you had a sugary breakfast cereal, your arteries are contracting nicely, but they can't relax. So your blood pressure goes up. Almost 100% of our blood pressure epidemic is due to sugar consumption and processed carbohydrates. These people have severe magnesium deficiency. That is why they have high blood pressure. In older people, the arteries become sclerotic, particularly in the brain, and your body has to think about all the organs. So it will raise your blood pressure in order to feed the brain properly. Of course, our cardiologists don't think about the brain. They only focus on the heart, don't they? So they say, oh, this high blood pressure is too hard for your heart. You must take tablets to reduce your blood pressure. The person starts taking these tablets, next week, bang, stroke. The person dies from a stroke. More than 60% of our strokes are caused by cardiologists prescribing blood pressure medications. Whatever your blood pressure is, is the right blood pressure for you. There is no such thing as the right blood pressure. Whatever your individual blood pressure is, is the right blood pressure for you. Don't interfere with it. Whole grains in moderation, whole grains need to be prepared properly. In Switzerland, we had a community in the Lointile village in, in the valley, which was studied extensively because it was a traditional community and it didn't have the modern civilization reaching it yet. In order to prepare bread, it took them two weeks to prepare bread. And the loaves were this big, and then they will hang them and they will last them for a long time. Grains have many anti-nutrients in them. Substances which damage human body. Lectins, phytates, oxalates, salicylates, and other things. They are very harmful for the human body and they're indigestible. That is why all traditional cultures developed ways of pre-digesting grains. Fermentation is the most important thing to do with grains. Grains need to be fermented for a long time before we make bread from them. Because the bacteria in the fermentation process break down lectins, break down phytates, break down gluten, and break down other substances in the grains. And when you make a proper sourdough bread, which does take a few days to, to make, to prepare, that will digest well in your body and will do you only good. That's the only bread that we human beings should be eating. But of course, our food industry doesn't do that. They prepare processed concoctions for us, shaped in the form of bread, and we believe that that's bread. That's not bread, that is a poison. Beans and pulses, the same, have many anti-nutrients. They're very difficult to digest. That is why they need to be properly prepared before we eat them. Fermentation is an important part, and simply soaking. All traditional cultures will soak their beans for 24 hours, then wash them very well, then cook them, then probably ferment them a little in the cooked form, and only then they will eat them. 
because they knew that in that form they are more digestible, they feed us a little bit more, and they do not damage our digestive systems. Natural fats, we talked about it a lot today. The best fats for consuming for human body are animal fats, and they're the best fats for cooking. If you roasted a duck, your duck will be sitting in fat that high, pour that liquid fat through a sieve into a glass jar, and keep it in the fridge. It'll last for half a year, and do all your frying and cooking on this fat. Tomorrow you cooked some pork, you have another jar. After tomorrow you cooked lamb, you have another jar. Very soon you'll finish up with a collection of jars in your fridge with lots of animal fats. They're all very healthy, very good for us. And they can be heated and reheated many times because they're stable. They don't get damaged by heat the same way the plant oils uh, get damaged. These are the only fats that we should be cooking on. If you want your chips, if you want to you fry your potatoes, you fry them on this fat and they'll be healthy for you instead of vegetable oils. Butter and ghee should be consumed and we can cook on them. Coconut oil is a fully saturated fat and it has many, many health benefits for the human body. That is why uh, people in tropics and other places always cooked on coconut oils. Until, of course, our modern propaganda reached them and started supplying them with genetically modified soya oil, which replaced coconut oil in their cooking. <coughs> Cold-pressed virgin olive oil. Olive oil is quite stable because it's largely made out of monounsaturated fatty acid called oleic acid. But the value of it is not in the oleic acid. The value of the olive oil is in the micronutrients, which give it green color and spicy taste. Phytonutrients, antioxidants, phenols, salicylates, and other things. These things kill cancer. They detoxify your body. They cleanse your body. They provide many good things. When we cook olive oil, we destroy them. We're just left with the oleic acid, nothing else. That is why I don't recommend cooking with olive oil. I recommend buying good quality olive oil, really good quality, cold extracted, and using it as a dressing on ready served meals. We don't need a huge amount of it. Three tablespoons a day, maybe a bit more, will be enough to supply you with good amount of vitamin E, excellent antioxidant, and many other good things. It's very healthy in that form. Other cold pressed plant oils, flax, avocado, walnut, borash, hemp, not for cooking. And be sure that you spoke to the manufacturer and you're sure that the manufacturer is honest and they're really honestly doing their best not to damage the soils during manufacture. They are very fragile. Deficiencies in fat soluble vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, and vitamin K are a major cause of heart disease, cancer, and every other disease. Human beings require these vitamins in ample amounts. If you're eating fat with your meal, if you're eating animal fats, in plentiful you will be getting plenty of these um, substances and you will prevent infections and prevent other problems. Avoid all margarines, butter replacement and so on, and cooking oils. Digestive health, we talked about it this morning. Most toxins floating in your blood come from your digestive system. So look after your digestive system. It is important, it has become a priority for almost 100% of the Western population because we have been subjected to antibiotics for far too long and many other chemicals which damage gut flora. Large percent of the population have abnormal gut flora. Without it, food does not get digested properly it doesn't absorb very well, so you develop multiple nutritional deficiencies and B vitamin deficit. Without B vitamins, nothing in the body works. Nutritional deficiencies lead to formation of homocysteine. Remember, in order to not have this damaging chemical, we need all the B vitamins coming from your gut flora's activity. If you don't get enough of them, you'll have this substance in your blood. It's terribly damaging and LPA, which appears in the blood when you are deficient in vitamin C and lipoic acid. 
and many other toxins are formed. Every course of antibiotics must be followed by a course of probiotics and fermented foods. Fermented foods should be a part of our daily diet, all of us. And you have the traditions in your culture. Just continue with it. Prevent heart disease naturally. What do we need to do? Stop eating processed foods. Difficult, isn't it, for many people? Stop polluting your body with man-made chemicals and look after your digestive system. If you do these three things, you will have no metabolic syndrome. Your insulin will be normal in your bloodstream. And that will guarantee that your body is slim and beautiful. There is no obesity. Because insulin is a fat storage hormone in the body. If you have high levels of insulin, everything you eat will be stored as fat, converted into fat. Molecules of glucose get converted into fat. <clears throat> and you will prevent every other disease in the body, not only heart disease. This is my book, which is written in a language that anybody will understand. But it is fully referenced for the medical doctors. So if you want to give a book to your medical doctor, please give them this book. They can't argue with it because it has all the scientific studies in it. It's all referenced, but it's written in a simple to understand language so anybody can read it, not only medics. And these are my contact details. Thank you very much for listening. Um, bezüglich des gesunden Ei, um, Eigelbs, muss das um, preferably um, roh sein oder kann es auch uh, zum Beispiel aus gekochten Eiern stammen? Und die zweite Frage, was ist mit, mit um, diesem Vollrohrzucker, der ja eigentlich alle diese um, um, Mineralien und Spurenelemente auch enthalten sollte, kann man den konsumieren oder ist der auch nicht empfehlenswert? Raw egg yolks have been compared to human breast milk. They literally require very little digestion, they absorb very quickly and they provide us with beautiful nutrition. Lots of zinc, amino acids in their single form, so your proteins can immediately be built. Lots and lots of B vitamins and lots of other wonderful things. When we cook, obviously all that nutrition is still there, but it is more difficult to digest. Cooked egg yolks are harder to digest. Many people get it repeated on them, get a reflux from it, and some people get constipated and get gas from cooked eggs. From raw eggs, you will not get that. Raw egg white recently has been discovered to chelate toxic metals. That's amazing. So we can remove, by eating raw egg whites, we can remove mercury and lead and other toxic metals out of the body. What I recommend to people when they start juicing on the GAPS nutritional protocol, you've made your glass of juice by pressing vegetables and fruit with your juicer, break a couple of raw eggs in it, best quality, from pasture, chickens, organic, and a tablespoon of your sour cream that you've made at home from raw cream, whisk the whole thing, and that turns it into a, like a milkshake consistency. We call it GAPS milkshake. And that will remove all those stones from your liver, improve your bile flow, improve your fat digestion, clean up your liver, and remove many toxic metals and give you fantastic nutrition. Many people have it as a breakfast. Two eggs in your glass of juice, sour cream, the juice, you've drunk it, off you go. You won't be hungry until lunchtime, and you will get the best nutrition. The raw cane sugar also processed substance. It has a little bit more than an ordinary sugar, but I will not recommend it. Eat honey and eat dried fruit. These things are made by Mother Nature. They are fully balanced. They will do us only good. Okay. Um, Brot. Es ist meines Erachtens sehr gefährlich. Um, wie lange muss man es mindestens fermentieren, damit es nicht gefährlich ist? Also gut für den Körper. Die Fermentation des Getreides. When GAPS keep people have recovered fully and they start coming off the GAPS diet, the first thing we do, we take white organic flour, white please, not with bran in it, because bran is indigestible 
and it has the wrong kind of fiber, it scratches, the digestive system damages it. Bran is not good. White organic flour, we add our kefir to it, homemade kefir, a bit of water, make it into a, a, a pastry, and put it in a warm place for two days. Kefir will ferment the flour, pre-digest it, it will break it apart. In two days it will increase in volume, it will be all bubbly, sitting there smell lovely. You bring it to your kitchen then, you add some eggs into it, mix the eggs, and you make crepes, pancakes from it, crepes. And the person has one pancake on the first day, and then we watch them for a few days what happens. If the digestive system has recovered, nothing happens. And that's a great news for the person. So we can make the pancakes a regular, that, this is sourdough pancakes, real sourdough. They will not only taste beautiful, they have a sour taste to them. If you add a bit of salt there, there will be that. After those pancakes are well tolerated, we start making bread the same way. We add kefir to flour, we add salt, we add whatever else you want to add to it, maybe sunflower seeds, maybe some nuts, maybe some sun-dried tomatoes or whatever. You knead it, you make the dough, you put it in the shape for the bread that you're going to bake, and then you put butter on top, cover it with a towel, and you put it in a warm place for two days. It has to ferment for two days. In two days, it will rise, it will become big. You put it in the oven and you bake it. And that will be your sourdough bread. Commercial sourdough bread is not prepared like that. And many people find it difficult to digest. So if you want to start introducing bread, start from that kind of homemade bread. I have these recipes on my website.